Turn with me, if you would, to uh, Matthew, the 16th chapter. Matthew 16. We've been on a, a subject for a few weeks now that we're calling the keys of the kingdom. A lot of times people say keys to but that's not what it said. It's keys of, the keys of the kingdom. And we see it in Matthew 16 and also in uh, Matthew 18, uh, a reference to it. Matthew 16, um, down in verse uh, 18, uh, Jesus said, you are Peter, and upon this rock, which is a different word, the the rock of Christ, the rock of the Christ, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it or they shall not be able to withstand it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Skip over to the 18th chapter of Matthew, 18 and 18. He said, Verily I say to you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Are we supposed to bind anything? Yes. Are we supposed to loose anything? Yes. What does it mean, the keys of the kingdom? If you're given the keys to something, you're given control of it keys of a vehicle, keys of an apartment, keys of a warehouse or whatever, then if you're given the keys, you now have access. You can go in there, you can uh, deal with what's in there, receive what's in there, you can prevent others from getting in there. If it's a vehicle, you can use the vehicle, make the vehicle do what it does and do it for your benefit. Keys uh, represent control. And the control is specifically the authority. When he said, I give you the keys of the kingdom, I mean, the, the sentence is not even complete. Whatever you bind. Well, that, that must mean you have authority to bind. Whatever you loose, that must mean you have been authorized. You have authority to loose. Now, I know from, from doing this for a few years and just some interaction with other parts of the body of Christ, this is something most of the church does not believe. Most of the church believes that Jesus has authority. They don't believe the church has authority, the, bo the body of Christ has authority. They don't believe the believer has authority. But I, I don't want that to be the case with us. I don't want that to be the case with Faith Life Church. I want us to believe the Bible, not religious tradition. And it's the enemy who doesn't want you to believe you have authority because that authority is over him. That's right. No wonder he fights so hard to obscure this and to keep people either in the dark, ignorant, or confused about it. And people think they're being humble when they said, oh, I, I can't do anything. It's all the Lord. Well, it's not all the Lord. He didn't say, here's the keys to the kingdom. I do everything. Huh? Did he? What, did he? what did he say? I give you the keys of the kingdom, whatever you, you bind. 
on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Are we supposed to bind something? Yes. Have you been binding anything? Yes. That's not everybody. <laughs> have, have you been binding anything? Have you been loosing anything? Then the Lord didn't give you the keys? Huh? Oh, you just hadn't been using them. Huh? Do you see what I'm talking about? Do, do not let this just slide past you. Get it settled. Well, I don't know if I agree with you, Brother Keith. Forget about Brother Keith. Bible. Matthew 16. Matthew 18. Jesus talking. Red letters. Huh? Get it settled. What did he tell us? What does it mean? Did he really give us authority? Did he? Because he sure walked in authority on the earth and then he delegated authority to the 12 and then he delegated authority to the 70 and then after he raised from the dead in Matthew, Mark 16, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel and these signs will follow them that believe. That's right. Them that believe. That's right. Is that all that believe? Is that all believers? One of the signs is they will cast out demons. Amen. Well, you must have authority. Amen. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Well, you must have authority. Amen. Must have authority. Here's something to take note of. Jesus never sent anyone to preach without giving them authority. Oh, come on. Did you hear that? Jesus never sent anyone to preach the gospel or to teach the word of the kingdom without giving them authority and power over all evil spirits and all sickness. He did it every time. And that's what uh, Mark 16 is saying, that after Jesus has, uh, you know, raised from the dead, he, he is speaking authority over all believers. These signs, what kind of sign? These signs will follow them that believe. Turn over there. Somebody might not be as familiar. Mark 16. Mark 16. Jesus has gone to the cross. He has raised from the dead. Mark 16. Verse 14, he appeared to them. Verse 15, Mark 16, 15, he said to them, go, go ye into all the world. So uh, is the church authorized to go? Yes. Yeah, most, most people don't have a problem with that. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, is the church authorized to preach the gospel? Yes. This is the main directive to the church. We've got to watch about getting sidetracked with any other thing. This is the main directive because the greatest need of human beings is spiritual, not natural. There are natural needs, but the greatest need is spiritual. Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to every creature, every created being. Keep going. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believes not will be damned or, or condemned. Keep going. And these signs, these signs will follow them that believe. Are you a believer? I'd like to see a, all believers raise your hand. Are you, are you a believer? Are you a believer? Does this apply to you? These signs will follow them that believe. Sign number one. In my name. They will cast out. That's the word for demons. They'll cast out demons. How could you do that if you didn't have authority? How could you do that? How will you do it in his name? If you've been given his name, the authority is in the name. You've been given authority. Somebody say, I'm a believer. I am a believer. And I have authority. And I have authority. 
Because I have the name. I've been given the name. And I have authority over all demons. Oh, they were hoping you wouldn't find that out. They were so, they were so hoping that at least you would just kind of let it slide and not pay much attention to it and never really get fully convinced enough to act on it. The keys of the kingdom is the control, is the authority, and that's how you function in the kingdom. Spiritual things are going on. God is spirit. The Holy Spirit is spirit. The Word of God is spirit. Jesus said, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and truth. They that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, uh, good things, God things are spirit. Well, the enemy's things are spirit. He is going about seeking whom he may devour, the scripture said. And, and Peter said, Res whom resist steadfast in the faith. Is he talking to all of us? Yes. That the devil is going about, this is 1 Peter 5, the devil's going about seeking whom he may devour. And he told us to do what about that? Resist him. Resist the devil, steadfast in the faith. Now, if you have no authority, how can you do that? And if you had no authority, the enemy wouldn't pay any attention to you. You have authority. James said a similar thing. James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Why would he flee from you? Because you're so amazing. You're so smart. You're so tough. Nah, that ain't it. Why would he flee from you? You've been alive that long. Even if you're 80 years old, 90, 100 years old, and have walked with the Lord, you know a little bit. But we're talking about beings who've been around, we don't know how long. Millennia on top of millennia. Why would these spirits run away from you? Why would they do that? Why? It's not because you know so much. Not because you're so smart. Not because you're so powerful as a physical being. That wouldn't scare them. That wouldn't shake them. Why? Because you have been authorized by the head of the church, Jesus. And they're terrified of him. They're terrified. Of him. Don't you remember when he would show up in the synagogue, spirits would cry out and said, Oh, oh, we know who you are. Don't hurt us. Don't hurt us. Right. When they say, Don't, don't hurt us. Are you, can you come to torment us before the time? Please, please don't. Please don't. Please don't. <laughs> and he would say, Shut up and get out of here. And away they would go. <laughs> well, what does that mean when he tells you? Resist the devil. And what will happen? What will happen? What will happen? Oh, somebody might not know it. Go to, go to James. Go to James. James 4. This is not something I made up. It would have been a great honor to, to have penned it. But it was the Holy Spirit who said it. James 4, 7. Number one, submit yourselves to God. That puts you in position to exercise this authority. And then number two, do what? Resist. Who's going to resist the devil? Huh? Nowhere in the New Testament are we told to pray and ask God to make the devil stop. And yet what is most of the church doing? Religion teaches you to beg. Religion, traditional religion, makes beggars of its practitioners. That's not the Bible. It's subtle, 
Because, you know, religion will take half of a verse and twist it. But the scripture says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. We already saw what Jesus said in Mark. We already saw what Peter said in 1 Peter 5. We're seeing what James says here in James. That's three witnesses already. Do you have authority? Are you told to beg God and plead with him to make the devil quit and make the devil stop? No, come on, read this, this one, verse right, one verse right here. James 4, 7, resist the devil. Who's the subject? Who's the understood subject? God? No. No. Who's going to resist the devil? God? God? No. You. Look at your neighbor and say, you. You are going to resist the devil. You. You resist the devil. And, and Resist the devil and he will flee from God. That's not what it said. That's not what it said. You resist the devil and what will happen? The devil will flee from you when you resist him. What if you don't resist him? Then he will stay. He will stay and cause you problems and steal and kill. And destroy everything he can. And he won't stop. He will not stop until you quit allowing it. Quit permitting it. Whatever you bind will be bound. You know, uh, uh, Brother Smith Wigglesworth, if you read about him, he, he lived a long time ago had a lot of great uh, miracles in his life and ministry. And is told that uh, he's an Englishman and uh, uh, told uh, one occasion where he and some people were waiting on a train and said, uh, uh, as they're waiting there, a little dog had followed one of the people to the train station and said, the owner looked at the little dog and said, oh, no, 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 you can't come. Uh, go back, go back. And so, so the little dog just stood there and wagged his tail. And so <laughs> uh, the trains, they heard the train coming, and he said, oh, no, come on, you have to go. You have to go and uh, leave. And he said, the little dog just wagged his tail and stayed. And finally, uh, you know, the, plant, the train is pulling up. And so the guy said, uh, get, get to the house. And so the little dog turned around and ran back to the house. And Brother Smith Wigglesworth just erupted and laughed. He said, that's it. That's how you talk to the devil. That's it. <laughs> what do you mean? You never say, oh, please, devil, would you go? Please, please, please. He'll say, no, no. <laughs> oh, please, oh, please. You cannot be successful spiritually begging. Begging. God did not make us beggars. Right. Say it out loud. Believers, Believers are not beggars. Are not beggars. Believers are not beggars. Why do I need to beg? Why would I need to beg man when God is my source? Huh? Why would I need to beg the devil when greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world? And why would I need to beg God to do something about the devil when he gave me authority and told me to do something about the devil? Most of the church doesn't believe this, much less practice it. But here are three witnesses, Jesus, Peter, James. Do we have authority? How could you resist the devil and him run away from you if you didn't have authority? What would he be running away from? Let, let me uh, read s some more things to you about delegation here. We, we touched on this, but I think some of this will, uh, will bear repetition. In, uh, in John, John 13, 20, they'll put it on the screen for us. John 13, 20, Jesus said, he that receives whomever I send receives me. Did uh, Jesus send us? Matthew 28, 
Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. What's the very next thing he said? Go. You go into all the world. Mark 16, we just got through reading. Jesus is raised from the dead. He said, you, these signs will follow you. Go into all the world and proclaim the good news. And these signs will follow them that believe, not just apostles, not just prophets, not just pastors, those who believe. Are you a believer? Yes. Then this is one of the things that's supposed to show up in your life. Amen. In my name, they will cast out demons, wrong spirits. They'll shut them down. Uh, the word cast out, uh, balo, is the word throw out, e eject is a good word. Eject. So when it would say Jesus cast out the spirit, he ejected him. <laughs> Reminds me of an ejection seat on a jet. And I mean, if you press that button, you better be serious about it because you are getting out of here in a hurry. Is that right? Whoom, you're gone. Well, I reckon that's how quickly the enemy left when Jesus put his foot down and said, get out of here, leave. And that's all you need to know as a believer is that authority that Jesus walked in, that Jesus obtained. The Bible said he got his name by inheritance. And then it talks about, we, we saw this in Ephesians, we've seen this in Colossians, that we have an inheritance, we have an inheritance. In fact, we saw in Romans, uh, they'll put it on the screen for us, Romans, the 8th chapter and the 16th verse, it says the, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And verse 17, and if we are children of God, how many will believe you are a child of God? We, do you believe? Huh? Surely you believe you're a child of God. If you're a child of God, then you're an heir of God. Well, what, what's an heir? An heir inherited something. Somebody died and left you something. And in this case, rose from the dead to see to it that you got it. Whew. What did he leave you? What did he leave you? Part of what he left you is his name and the authority that's in that name. If you are a child of God, then you are an heir of God. Keep reading with me. If you are an heir of God, what else are you? What else are you? Man, that word, if it, if it wasn't in the Bible, I don't know that I could believe it. Joint means equal heir. What does that mean? If Christ inherited it, you inherited it. If he has it, you have it. Does he have all authority in heaven and in earth? Does he? Does he? And you are an equal heir with him. Are you? Join air. Join air. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anybody know about joint accounts? You been married? I do. That means Phyllis can spend all my money without saying a word. Joint means, is that right? She has equal access to it as I do. Right? If it's in there, she can spend it like it's hers. Well, you, you didn't just get a joint account with somebody that had a lot of money. You're a joint heir with the head of the church, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. What does he have? Well, then you have it too. Man, it would help you so much. It'd help us so much to just go around the rest of the day, the rest of the week going, joint heir. I'm a joint heir. Joint heir. <laughs> I'm a joint heir with Jesus. Joint heir with Jesus. Joint heir. Equal heir 
with Jesus. It, it seems too big to believe, but I didn't do it. You didn't do it. He did it. It was his choice. And, and it shouldn't be. I mean, the reason it's so convoluted and, and people are in the dark confused about it is because the enemy is always trying to hide this. Oh man, this is the last thing he ever wanted you to know because all its authority is, is over him. He's under our feet. He never wanted you to know that you could shut him down on some things. That you could stop him on some things. Oh, he didn't want you to believe that. He, he wants you to believe anything except that. Too late. Too late. Somebody say, I believe it. I, I believe the Bible. Joint heir. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. I'm a joint heir with the head of the church. He is an heir. Jesus has inherited the name above all names. And I am a child of God now, and you are, because of our faith in Jesus. And now we are also heirs of God like he is heir of God because we're in him. His, vic his victory is my victory. His inheritance is my inheritance. Come on, say it again, joint heir. Joint, joint heir. Joint heir. Joint heir. Go with me, if you would, to uh, Colossians, the first chapter. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whew. Church of the joint heirs. <laughs> Whew. Hallelujah. I'm a joint heir. That should make you want to find out what does Jesus have? What did he inherit in his, his birth, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension? What did he accomplish? And, and why did he accomplish it? In Colossians 1 and 12, Colossians 1 12 says, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. The word meet is also translated fit. Now see, the, the, the thought would come, well, man, I'm, you know, I'm human. I've made so many mistakes. How in the world could I be worthy to be a joint heir with Christ? You never could be which is why God had to make you <laughs> worthy. <laughs> by the blood of Jesus, by the righteousness of Christ, He, the Father, say it out loud, the Father, the Father has made me meet, has made me, meet, has made me fit, has made me, fit, has made me, able, has made me able to be a partaker, be a partaker of the inheritance of the, inheritance, of the saints, of in light. Now, that's not even the end of the sentence. Do you see that? Next verse. Next verse. Who has delivered us from the, and that word is the word for authority, the authority of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. What's the keys of the kingdom? We, if we had not been delivered out of the authority of darkness, then a darkness would still have authority over us. And all unsaved people are in that position. Even people that may have some good about them morally and whatever, if they are lost, they are being ruled over by the darkness of this world. They don't even realize it. They don't even understand it. But that's what's happening. They are under the power and control of darkness. But not you. I said not you. I said not us. Because when we believed on Jesus and confessed Jesus as Lord of our life, we were born again. Born from above. 
and the mighty power of God lifted us up out from all authority and dominion of darkness and has placed us into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of his dear son. And in this kingdom, we have been given the keys of the kingdom. Said out loud, darkness has no dominion over me. What does that mean? No control. The devil, his evil spirits, have zero control over me. I, I like something that Jesus said so much. When uh, it was time to go to the scourging and to the cross, Jesus said, uh, the prince of this world is coming. This is his hour. This is the hour of darkness. But he went on to say, he has nothing in me. He had nothing in him. He had nothing over him. Oh, come on. Can you see that? Nothing. Nothing. He had never given any place to the enemy. Now, sadly, all of us have. We sin, come short of the glory of God. But that's why Jesus went to the cross, because he knew we couldn't do it ourselves. So he did it for us. He bought us. He redeemed us bought us out from under the dominion of darkness. And so with confession, Jesus as your Lord and being born again, now the devil has lost all say and all authority over you. Yes. Now, if you're foolish, you'll go back and yield to him with some different stuff, but you don't have to. I said, you don't have to. I want you to say out loud, the devil has no authority. Over me. Over None. None. Now that means he, now all his cohorts put together, cannot force you to do anything. Ever. The only way they can have any manifestation in your life is if they can deceive you or trick you or tempt you into yielding to them. Giving place to them. But they cannot force you. Can't, cannot, can't make you do anything. Because greater is he. I said greater is he. Greater. Oh, you could preach in here today. Greater. Greater is he that is in you. Somebody say greater, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You have been delivered out of all the authority and power of darkness. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What did Jesus do for us? What did he do for us? He has delivered us from the power and authority of darkness. He has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We're in a different kingdom now. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Now, did you hear when he said, I give you the keys of the kingdom, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. We need to talk more about that. I think you'll need to come back on another day. But... Uh, there's a heaven-earth thing going on, heaven-earth connection, but he uh, allows what we allow. If you bind it on earth, it'll be bound in heaven. If you loose it on earth, uh, you see some of the modern translations, they try to turn it around. They're uncomfortable with what Jesus said, and they try to change the text, but that's not what, uh, their change is not right. It stands as it's written. How many believe Jesus didn't make any mistake? He said it the way he meant to say it. So don't change it. He said, whatever you bind on earth first will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Are we supposed to be binding something? 
Are we supposed to be shutting some things down? Forbidding some things? Stopping some things? And when it comes to good things, are we supposed to be loosing some things? Allowing some things? Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Say it out loud another prayer. Say, Father, Father teach, me more about this. teach me more about this. Reveal it to me. Reveal it to me. How, show me how to do it. He, he goes on to say, by him, verse 16, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. That's the word for authorities. All things were created by him and for him. Did you see here? Visible and invisible. We know there are visible kingdoms here. The, the USA is a kingdom. The, uh, all the nations uh, of the world that have economies and militaries and, and have jurisdiction and control over certain areas, they are kingdoms, whether they call them that or not. And there are visible kingdoms and there are invisible kingdoms. There are spiritual activity behind what we see, influencing all you got to do is ask yourself, where do thoughts come from? Phyllis and I have been talking about, you look at some of the plans that some leaders have for their nations and countries, and you shake your head and you go, what? That's never worked, you know? There's proof everywhere that that doesn't work, that it can't work. Well, they, And some of these people are obviously intelligent people, so why are they so bent on, on doing these things that will never work? They're influenced by wrong spirits. Now, we don't have authority over everybody, but we got authority where we live, and we need to start shutting some things down spiritually. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Quit getting mad at people and hollering and fussing and cussing and posting about stuff. Said out loud, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. That's not your real problem. Because even if the people that you think are the biggest problem, and if we could just get them removed, if nothing changed, the enemy would have somebody else in their place just like that, and they could be worse than them. You didn't solve the problem. You didn't fix the problem because the problem wasn't the person. The problem was the unseen. Did you hear these words? Visible and invisible. They're, they're invisible influences going on. No, what we want to do. You, now, we're going to talk about this uh, more about the limits of our authority. One of the limitations is you and I don't have authority over human spirits. Amen. Not over human spirits. Over evil spirits we do, but not over human spirits. And uh, there, there are things to see there. We'll, we'll get into that later. C can you keep coming? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> come, come back for, for more. You know, next Sunday or next, and if the Lord tears is coming. And, and so, uh, he, he went on to say, verse 17, he's before all things and by him all things consist and he is the head of the body. Now, now hold on, hold on. Why talk about he uh, has this authority over all dominions, principalities, authorities, and next thing he says, he said, and he's the head over the body, the church. Well, Jesus is not here in person. He left. He ascended on high. He's at the right hand of majesty on high. His spirit is here. The Holy Spirit came. Well, what about his authority in the earth? It's invested in his body. That's why in Ephesians and here and place after place after place, when he talks about the Lord has all authority, all authority, next thing you know, he's talking about the church. He's ahead, we're the body. Ephesians, what did it say? The Lord 
has given him a name which is above every name. Hallelujah. And he has that authority over all, he's been given that over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Amen. Ephesians 1 says. Why say that? Why say that? You can't separate Jesus' authority from his body. You must not separate Jesus' authority and his name from his church, from his body. Because we are joint heirs. Yes. Joint heirs. Oh, somebody say, I'm a joint heir with Jesus. What does that mean? Whatever he inherited, I inherited jointly, equally. <laughs> Woo. Whatever he got, I inherited it with him. See, that's why the second, we, we just quoted from Ephesians 1, the second chapter goes on to say, so you who were dead in trespasses and sins, he raised you up by grace you're saved through faith. You've been raised up together with him, made to sit together with him. Join air. Join air. Raised with him, seated with him, inherited with him, authorized with him, empowered with him, with him. Joint heir. Joint heir with Jesus. And ver, ver, Colossians 1.18 said, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is the head, we're the body. Now go to chapter 2 in Colossians. You got a couple more minutes? Colossians 2 and chapter 9. Oh, this is shouting ground. Not like we hadn't been on shouting ground already, but oh, this is, whoo. In him... In Jesus, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's bigger than we understand. Verse 10, and, and you are, you know, in decent shape. You know what religion says? Religion says in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are an old sinner. May be saved by grace. We hope. We'll see. That's religion. That's man's tradition. That's not Bible. Jesus is everything. He has everything. When he went to the cross and became sin, was made sin with our sin and judged in our place and ju justice was satisfied after three days and nights when he went to the heart of the earth and he was raised triumphant over all of that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When that happened, he got it all. He got the keys. Revelation, he said, I got the keys. I got the keys of death, hell, the grave. That's why when he, when he appeared before the disciples after being raised from the dead, he said, all authority. <laughs> all authority in heaven. And on earth, everywhere, has been given to me. So, go. You go, you preach, you cast out spirits, you lay hands on the sick. Did he say it? Why? Because he didn't just get it for himself. He didn't need to be saved. 
He was doing all right in heaven <laughs> before. <Yeah. laughs> the devil had no authority over him, no control over him. He didn't need to get that for himself. He got it for us. I said he got it for us. He got it for us. And now we're joint heirs. No, in him, Colossians 2, 9, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I mean, you, you can't make a bigger <laughs> all-encompassing statement than that. And you are complete in him. Somebody say, I'm complete. I'm complete. That means you got it all. I'm complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power or authority, in whom also you were circumcised with the circumcision made with thy hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You've been buried with him in baptism, wherein also you've been risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who's raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him and forgiven you all trespasses. Somebody say buried with him, risen with him, quickened together with him. I'm complete in him. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Go to Hebrews in closing, I think. No guarantees, just Hebrews and the second chapter. Oh, we have, uh, we've operated so far below our place in him and our authority. It ought not be that the devil can rule over the body of Christ and destroy at whim and will and nobody in the church even resist him. See, most of the church, instead of resisting the devil, they'll blame God. That's how confused they are. They'll attribute Stealing and killing and destroying to God. They say, well, God must have had some purpose in it and we just don't know. And the devil's going, that's right, keep believing that. Yeah, that's right. While he just destroys and destroys and nobody says a word. Nobody re resists him. Nobody binds him. He is literally getting away with murder yeah. Yeah. every day yeah. on the planet. But Jesus gave us the keys, the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosed. In Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 9, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Now this is the same thing we've been reading about in Ephesians and Colossians. We were, we, we, we were buried with him. You know, the scripture said, I, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Uh, this is something that is so amazing here. If the Lord tears his coming. You won't live on the earth forever. There will come a time when you breathe your last and your body dies. But as a believer, you won't taste death. You know, people talk about, well, everybody, you know, dies alone. And no, are you kidding? No, you're not dying alone. 
Uh-uh. When your spirit leaves your body, the Lord will receive you. I said, you're going to see him. You're going to see your angel. You're going to see him and your kin folks that are already there. Alone? No. More lies. But you won't taste of death. The, the bitterness, the terror, uh, uh, the fear of death. You won't even taste it. You'll be out of your body probably for several minutes before you even realize that you are. And one of the main things going through your mind is, I feel good. <laughs> no, no more aches, no more pains, no more darkness, no more confusion. Whoo! Mm. He tasted death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory. And you are one of them. So am I. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings, which he did. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one, join heir, for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus calls you brother. We're talking about the head of the church. We're talking about the one seated at the right hand of majesty on high. Somebody call your name and say, do you know them? Jesus said, yeah, yeah, that's my brother. Whew. If you called him brother down here, if you denied him, the scripture said he'll deny you. But if you call him Lord and brother down here, he's going to call your name in that day after this life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Call your name. You're going to be so glad to hear him call your name. He said, I will declare your name unto my brethren. Verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Why? Jesus became a human being. Completely became a human being. He even laid aside his omniscience as God, his omnipotence as God. The scripture said he emptied himself in Philippians, if you look at other translations. He emptied himself. He didn't quit being God, but he laid it. Somebody said, well, how could you, if you're God, how could you lay that aside? If you're God, you can do things, okay? <laughs> <laughs> This is the mystery of, you know, God made flesh. There's some things your head won't fully grasp about that yet. But he did it. And he became a man. And did what he did as a man. And hung on the cross as a man. Went to the heart of the earth as a man. Was raised from the dead. As a man. And everything he did as a man was for man. What he did as a man was for man. For us. For human beings. Hallelujah. That's what he said. He, uh, he, he was a partaker of flesh and blood, just like us. That through death, he might destroy him that had. Oh, I want you to underline that word. H-A-D. The devil ain't what he used to be. Huh? H-A-D means the devil ain't what he used to be. He's not. He used to have the power of death. 
And you used to be under his dominion and control of darkness, but you're not anymore. You, you've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness, put into the kingdom of God's dear son, and the devil has no power over you. He, somebody say, he has no power over me. He has no power. In fact, I have authority over him. Woo, glory. That he through death, that's why Jesus had to die because he had to get the power of death that was over us. He had to get that from the enemy. That's why he died. That's why he went to the heart of the earth and was there for those three days and nights. And he got it. When he was raised triumphant, that's why now in Revelation he says, I am he that liveth and was dead and am alive forevermore. And I've got the keys. Oh, that makes the devil cry when he hears that. You talking about singing the blues? He sings the blues. Why? Because who key, whose keys are those? They used to be his. They used to be his. He used to have the power of death. Not anymore. Not anymore. In fact, in a very short amount of time, the Lord's going to come and death itself is not going to continue. Death is the last enemy that shall be put underfoot. And in the, in the world to come, and God's kingdom is established, uh, there'll be nothing that'll die. The grass won't die. The flowers won't die. The trees won't die. The animals won't die. Nothing on your body will even age. Much less die. We're about to be done with death. Through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And so Jesus became a merciful high priest, having become man. He experienced every temptation human beings could ever experience. He didn't deal with the enemy and with the curse and life with some unfair advantage over us. He did it just like any other human being would have to do it, but he triumphed over every test, every trial. He went to the cross. He paid the price. He did it as a man. And he did it for man. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say, join air. Join air. Stand on your feet, everybody. Join air. 